There we go. Stefan Flam of Godin. Thank you so much for uh, for hanging out this morning. Uh, hey. Still morning, right? Yeah. Hmm. How's it going? Everything's good, man. Down yeah. in my uh, down in my studio in South Carolina. South Carolina. That's right. I remember. You know, I I always think of you as as a New York guy, but I remember you had property down there. Was uh was a rental? Was a rental property? <laughs> My wife's from Charleston, and uh, I met her uh, 25 years ago, and she was in college in New York. So I came down here. Charleston loved it, and uh, I reside down here in the summer. And I also recorded the majority of the uh, Godin album down here. So I, this is a little, uh, my uh, music cave, as you see, <laughs> records and all my, some of my toys and stuff like that. So Some, some kettlebells for good measure. Oh yeah, you saw those down there. Yeah, <laughs> well, you people get this thing. Yeah, I also have uh, another life that goes on in the background. Yeah, uh, I want to talk to you. You're you're more than a year out from from the Garden record, right? From from going beyond darkness, as it were. Uh, you spent years of your life. I know this. Years of your life writing recording building this huge story this encompassing apocalyptic rebirth story uh with the with the time that's passed do you feel like you've been able to get any distance at all from this record or is your head still like right in it um we've already written four songs for the next record and we are introducing another well that's like character. 35 minutes right there all yeah, right well we're going to shorten it down a little i don't know if we're going to go with that what was it eight manifestations last time <laughs> around we're going to simplify it, but we had a lot to say to set the story and get it moving and have its momentum that's why we it ended up being a double album because it was just a lot of stuff to kind of fit in but um i feel like at this well, musically i feel a little drained because like you know putting that record out was a lot of uh, time and energy. I mean, you know, we spoke at Roadburn when we hung out. And so you know how long I worked on that record. Probably. Years. 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 Yeah. Years. A lot of the material was uh, for, for winter, but uh, ultimately it didn't really work out that way. Um, and I ended up taking my own direction with Tony. And, um, but yeah, we're moving forward. Um, you know, Voss is still going to continue to be Nixta. And Tony saw the prophet of God and, and was introducing maybe some other elements to it to keep the story kind of moving. And, you know, in, in, in this day and age, um, you, you try to find things to write about or things to have some type of content. So, you know, we all read like books and movies and so on. So it's kind of like a, like a big collaboration of all of our different thoughts and we put them together. It's been a really big creative process um so yeah that's kind of where we're at but we're moving forward with it i'm happy with the record it seems to be people seem to be enjoying it uh, from a musical standpoint from the story part uh some folks are getting you know you're more your fantasy type of dungeons and dragons type of you know uh people tend to kind of dig it um it's kind of where where we're at with it hmm. uh how Okay, so if everybody's kind of contributing to the story and 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 bringing different ideas to, to it, how do you feel about that? Because Beyond Darkness, I mean, at least mostly was was coming from you, story wise, right? Uh, conceptually, I had a lot of the concepts. I'm not really a lyricist. I don't have that gift. I have uh, thoughts, ideas, and I'm really good at like I like the kind of like the ringleader. Mm -hmm. So I have, I kind of guide people a little bit. Tony is a really good writer. I mean, he's like legitimately like, you know, he's going to probably be an English teacher or something. And um, he reads and writes and takes creative writing classes and really enjoys writing. And I sit with him many nights and go over different concepts and then he kind of runs with it. So, um, and Voss also is, um, she writes all of her own lyrics in general. 
and she usually sticks mostly in the darkness and I let her do her thing. And then me and Tony kind of work with the, with the prophet of God and, and some of the guiding where the story kind of goes. So I don't write the lyrics, but I'm certainly part of the concept. The concept is definitely mine, um, but other people are helping collaborate. And I like that because it gets set of the box and it makes me think, you know, different, you know, when you collaborate with people, that's the beauty of the art of it, isn't it? That someone brings up, say, a certain word or whatever it is, and, oh, I really like that, but I'm not really in love with this. And then next thing you know, you're looking at like a thesaurus and other different types of ideas start to happen, like like any writer kind of right. does. And it's a, it makes it a really enjoyable, um, you know, journey to kind of go that way. I, I'm kind of digging it uh, the way it's going. And we also have quite a few musicians that play along with the project as well, too. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on it, I guess. You mean beyond you, Tony and Fass? Yeah, so there's basically um the first album had three different drummers on it it had Vic right. Pullman, who was winter's drummer right. yep it's uh scott wino who uh he lives out in oakland Vic lives in new york and then we have jason franz who was in christian death um he lives out in colorado so we had three different drummers on the first record the new one we'll we'll see who so far jason's been doing a lot of the uh the drumming on it i enjoy working with him um, and there's been some, you know, there's a violin player, there's Margaret Murphy, uh, Steve Murphy from King Destroy's uh, sister. Yeah. She, I consider her part of Garden. And, you know, she's like a renowned, like, violin cello. I think she's actually a university teacher as well, too, if I remember. So I um, have a couple of different interesting people. Ava Petrick, uh, she helps me with the, the visual part of it. So all mm -hmm. the authors was Ava's. Uh, I met her at an anti-aging conference in New York and we met through a mutual friend and she helped me create the, I said, here's the, here's the concept. The album was already done when I met Ava and I kind of gave her the, the concept. And then I looked through her artwork and if you look at all like Prophet of God and Nixta and then there's me Space Winds and you'll notice there's like these shadow things with there's like a symbol almost. Those are all from Ava's uh, shadow exhibition that she had done. And then mm -hmm. all the artwork, like the gatefold of the garden record, that is uh, Stefan's Cathedral in Vienna. And then the other one for the manifestations is St. John's Divine in New York City. Um, Ava was really helpful to kind of, she was, do, there was a, an exhibition with had artists from around the world and they're in St. John Divine. Ava's uh, things, that, if you look at the gatefold, it looks like an orb hanging in a church. It's really not a stone hanging in a church. She literally hangs like tapestry kind of things and they set them up in scaffolds. If you look close, it's literally like almost like fishing wire that drops them. She shoots light through them and she photographs them and videos them. And that's how she makes her art. She's a multimedia artist um, and her artwork gets shipped around the world. She does this in many different churches around the world. And um she was like a really interesting person to add to the project. She helped um, help get the visual part of it together. So I sat with her many, many nights on the phone as well, trying to kind of, kind of like going through different things and how are we going to make this work? And um, I mean, I love science fiction and, you know, Tony and Voss have their interest in mythology and stuff like that too. So um, those are some of the main players as far as who's, on the record and they're all super easy to work with and it's Oops. been a really yeah it's been a really great process the writing process for the first round was everything was kind of uh rehearsed and then recorded i have the studio here where i do all of like my overdubs and more stuff like that if you look over to the left i can show you later it's actually a control room window and on the other side of this window right here is usually where drums and amplifiers and things are set up for ISO. Isolate, yeah. Yeah, so isolate things. and But most of it was, all of uh, Beyond Darkness was tracked at Tony's. And then um, overdubs here. And obviously I could do some in my apartment. I have like a guitar in the closet, whatever, with like blankets over it and so right, on. Right. That's just like the basic process. But um, yeah, that's kind of. Um, and that, that Tony's, um 
basement where we do everything it was literally Winter's rehearsal studio for where we rehearsed for quite a few years, especially when we did all the reunion shows. All of our old Winter's equipment is there. Everything is there. So everything basically we use for Into Darkness, mm -hmm. I, still own, I still own all my guitar amps and uh, pedals and all my things and toys. I was fortunate I'm not to have to sell anything. So basically it was a matter of uh, Winter moved out and then got and set up interfaces, microphones, cables. And my brother, who you met as a recording engineer, he kind of gave us a little bit of uh, guidance on how to set it up. And he set us up and he helped us track the drums and everything. And we did it in the same, in the winter rehearsal space. And it's still currently set up like that. We never broke anything down. So still microphones and everything on there. And when, every time we're ready, we go in there, we track a song, we kill it, put it on the shelf. And then, you know, at that point, I usually send it to Voss and then she does her magic and she has a home little studio as well that she uses. And then she does her thing. So we're kind of working some of the songs out that way, especially mm -hmm. with it was, you can't really get everyone in a room together at the moment. So kind of, but we're still, you know, it's been a way to be creative and be positive and what's going on. And, you know, so yeah, it's kind of, kind of the process a little bit. Hmm. You see, and you know, I, I get, I get what you mean by creative and positive, but that, you know, the album is uh, so consuming and so dark. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny to think of it that way. Um, where does the, where does the story go after Beyond Darkness? <laughs> Well, if you, if you, when you listen, you get to the eighth manifestation, the last yep. one, it does leave off in a place of hope, right? You're, you're talking about like a recreation. Rebirth, yep. Birth. yep. So yep. that's where I think it'll start to go into another, another, like uh, another place. We'll take it from there and we'll try and bring it to another place um, and continue like this. Uh, maybe it'll be, I don't want to give too much away, but maybe it'll be a different planet or a different, you know, galaxy or a different place something else happening mm -hmm. like uh just an extension to the story that's already there kind of um we're going to keep some of the similarities uh like i said nixa will still be like a character that's part of god and always because boss will always be the lead singer as far as i'm concerned and uh tony will always have his element as a you know keyboard player as well as um He'll be the prophet of God and help us with the manifestations. We'll probably keep some of those things going because they kind of add the, a, a part of this like story or world or place that we're trying to create. And that part of the creative writing part of it as well, too. Right. Um, I think that's part of it. What's uh, keeps it interesting for people like Tony as well, because, you know, he's, he's a bit older than us, right? Like, uh, Tony was like 40 years old when I met him like 30 years ago when we did the winter album. So Tony's a bit older and he's, you know, he's played with the guys from Sir Lord Baltimore and all, all kinds of people. I think he tried for Deep Purple and a bunch of other things too. So he's an older cat and he has a lot of other stuff at his disposal and things that he's interested in. But writing is something he's always been interested in and never really had the opportunity to express. So with God and this mm -hmm. is, and the type of stuff that we're writing, he's all about, loves writing about, you know, end of the world kind of thing. You know, he loves like that scenario and, um, you know, things like Last Temptation of Christ and different, you know, he, he's read the Bible and he's read all different types of things. So he he brings a lot to it. And he's he's probably one of, um, one of the biggest creative forces behind it as well, too. And he's one of my oldest friends, too. I mean, I'm friends with Tony since 1989 or 1990. And we've always maintained like, a really really nice friend friendship for sure so how did you meet, voss, too, how did you meet voss was my was my next question um voss i'm uh when i was in after winter had separated um winter separated and nausea separated around the same time i was friends with uh roy mayoga mm -hmm. and on john jesse and we formed a group called thorn which was like a combination of winter and nausea I guess if they had a child, it would be Thorn in some kind of way. But Thorn was a little bit more of like an industrial kind of metal project. Mm -hmm. 
And um, Voss was like a friend of ours. I mean, she was in cycle slots and she was friends with all of us anyway. We knew her. And she had a group called Hansel und Gretel. Yep. And um, we played quite a few gigs with them. And um, I watched Hansel and Gretel many nights. And I was like, dude, she's a kick-ass, you know, female lead singer, you know. And um, I always loved what she did. And um, when I was thinking for Godin, I said, man, I would love to have a female singer for this, just to give it a little bit more of a, a different feel. And um, Bas also sings in German, Greek. She has a couple of different voices that she uses. And um, she was doing stuff like that for years already. And um, I noted it like 30 years ago that she was super talented and said, maybe one day I'll work with her. And then when the time came and I was looking for someone, I just, you know, I kind of called her up and said, hey, man, what are you up to? I have this new project. All the songs are done. You want to give it a shot? And the first song she had recorded was uh, Come Susa Toad. And she emailed me that track when she was done with it. And I sat down with Tony and we just looked at each other and it was like, no brain. I was like, Tony looked at me and says, I think we found our lead singer. And yeah. Relatively <laughs> obvious what was going on that she fit in really perfectly. And she brought something to the table that was really unique. And then we slowly finish one, send the next one, finish one, send the next one. That process took a couple of years, took about two and a half years for her to put her vocals or write lyrics to, you know, the 10 songs that are on musical songs that are on the album. Right. Um, that's kind of how we met. She's an old friend as well, too. I know Vaz for a long time. She's friends with my brother and a lot of my friends. She's part of our crew, really, as far as I'm concerned. She's old school. So. And, and you know, you mentioned, of course, she, the different voices and sort of the being able to embody different ideas uh, that she brings to the record is, is you know, a uh, huge part of, of, as you noted, building the world. Yeah, absolutely. That atmosphere. Yeah, absolutely. And she does what she does. And she does it really well. She puts everything into it. I can't even ask her to do more. Every time she sends me something, it's like, it sounds great. You know, like she's never sent something until she's truly ready. Yeah. Uh, and she's a pleasure to work with as well. So four songs done. Uh, we're, we're maybe headed to another planet, maybe another galaxy, maybe another World. Pla plane of being building a new world one way or the other um and and you know what's interesting about the prospect of a second garden record is it kind of pulls you farther away from from winter right like um now you're sort of building on something else and you know i know from, from talking to you before that that Tomji Warrior and, and Triptychon were kind of a, a, a not to say a, a, a role model, but, but kind of a role model. They uh, are, I doubt. I think it's a great way to describe it, actually. So, so with the prospect of, of now building on what, what Godin did on the first record, <sighs> how, how do you feel about that extra distance from what winter was? I love I love Into Darkness. I, I love the record. Um, me and John uh, Allman, singer, bass player of Windsor, were really proud when that record came out. There was not a thing about it that was controlled as far as the artwork or anything. We had 100% artistic freedom with that record. We did exactly what we wanted to do. The record sounded exactly like we, what we wanted it to sound like. Um, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the Thorn record as well, too. I mean, different thing. The winter record became iconic. Um, Godin was an, the first record was an extension. Like I said, a lot of the songs that were on the Godin Beyond Darkness were legitimately written for winter. They were intended to be the next winter record. Mm -hmm. I made a day in 2003 with about five songs and riffs from that thing were Dark Nebula, Egoi Mei E, um, Glowing Red Sun, the intro, we actually played that in Brooklyn when winter opened up the sun. So it's not like that. So it just was winter was not meant to move on, mm -hmm. uh, was not the pleasant experience that I'm having with my new members and friends. So and um, it felt like a good time to move on. 
I'm not scared to, to move a little further away from Windsor at all. When, when you mentioned Tripticon to Celtic Cross, you know, people have said, you know, what, what was a quote? Uh, um, Tripticon is to Celtic Cross what Godin is to Winter. Me personally, I love Celtic Cross. They're a major in influence for me, obviously. But if, you, but if I was going to go pick up a record and it was a Tripticon record, like the CD you listen to with Celtic Cross, I listen to the Tripticon record. I think the records are, are brilliant. I think they're well recorded. There's a, lots of great ideas and he built upon what he did in the past. You can't keep, you have to move forward. Yeah, his records are modern metal records. They sound great artistically, musically. He puts a lot into it. And I think, um, I think his records are great. I, I think I like him better than the Celt. Not, no disrespect to the earlier ones. I love right. them too. They're in my DNA. I listen to those albums a million times. But I do enjoy Tripticon. I like the direction he chose. Obviously, he chose like into the pandemonium and stuff. It was like an in-between stage. Didn't really transcend from the older fans to the new fans. But Tripticon, I think he really nailed it with it. I do see it as a little bit of a template um, for us going forward. Because we want to build upon what is. I mean, winter was over 30 years ago. You yeah. know, things are a little a little bit different now. I'm playing with some different some different people and um but i do think the essence of it is still there obviously if you hear by the riffs and the sound of it it's kind of if you really rip it apart and you just hit the bones of it, it they're really basically the, the riffs and songs are very primitive they're not very technical i'm not trying to be technical i'm literally trying to leave space when i'm playing guitar riffs sometimes i have to simplify them because i know tony's going to put some other chords that are going to be in there I know I have to leave some room now for a violinist that might add some melody line to it. So I'm trying to leave other elements in there. So it's right. not just our bass drums. So there's other sonic things that could fill the, the spectrum of sound so that people will hear things in it and it'll pull them in and, and they'll, they could get into it. Um, sure, it, God is, is relatively my project. I could be like, hey, I'm going to make it all guitar. I'm going to make it all this, but I'm looking at it. I have all these collaborators with me. I want them all to shine. I don't do the guitar solos on the album. I have friends that kick ass on guitar. Let them do it. I'm not that person. That's fine. I'm cool with that. Um, I could have injected my leads that were in there, but it was obviously nowhere near what the people who played on it did. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm open to letting other musicians, obviously it has to fit into the context of what we're trying to do, but yeah, that's kind of, um, I think we, it is going to be a, the next album will probably be a, a little bit different from Beyond Darkness. Um, hopefully, people will, will dig it, but it's in the same vein. It's definitely in very same kind of vibe. So it's not going to be some radical difference, but um, yeah. So that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. Tell me about uh, stripping. You know, stripping ideas down, uh, not. You, you mentioned, of course, letting other collaborators have space and uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, but in terms of, of things like the manifestations and sort of going from beyond darkness as a double LP to the next one thinking, I assume thinking a single LP instead. I think the next album will definitely be a single LP for sure. And we've already kind of decided that. Um, it was a lot to digest the first record. It was a lot, but we felt we had a lot. To say. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on your understatement. Yes. <laughs> we had a lot to say and we kind of like, we said, you know, if, first of all, smart for putting that record out. I mean, Tommy, thank you so much because for a new artist, for them to believe in us enough to let us put out a double vinyl, I'm sure, you know, caught was a cost effective to invest that type of money in a new artist? Probably, I don't know. I mean, it's a double album. It's a lot to ask. It's like putting two records out at once as far as cost goes. And we all know Smart and doesn't. And it's a know. gorgeous gatefold and the whole, I mean. It's like a 28 page booklet too. It doesn't um, look cheap. It doesn't look cheap. No, and they put a lot into it and, and um, they gave us artistic freedom as well, too, as far as what we wanted to do. They said it. I'm sure he never once blipped on the radar. He says, this is what you want to do. And I says, this is what we want 
gone to. And um, I had originally had, um, so we got it as totally 100% DIY. We record it. I, um, I'm, I edit, I record, I produce it. I publish it, which I own my own publishing com company. I manufactured it, which you had an original uh, demo of the exact album. So I, I manufactured it and then I- I still it. have. I don't get rid of, I don't get rid of that kind of thing. I still so, have. Awesome. If, uh, if God never does anything, uh, maybe it'll be worth something. Hey man, I, I <laughs> hoard that stuff. I don't, yeah, I don't throw that, anything out. That was a big, that was a big deal and a big undertaking to get it to that point. You know, we mastered it, everything. So what you hear on that demo, Smart didn't change anything. That record was mastered by Paul Lugos. And uh, that record was um, mixed by Roy Mayoga. So um, I spared no expense to make it sound the best it could sound, especially after, you know, we said five plus years of working on it at the end of the last process. Um, so yes, there is, there is a lot that went into that record and, but it was 100% DIY. No one told us anything. That's the only way I roll really at this point. So, um, but yeah. But if but if some of the riffs from Beyond Darkness go back to being winter riffs from 2003 and show up on a record 17 years later, <laughs> what's, what's your timeline on a follow-up? Um, well, I can tell you this. I have cassette tapes. I have like, you know, I'm playing my guitar or doing things all the time, right? I mean, you can huh. see I have other I have keyboards and other things I use too. Um, I just have like a little library of riffs and sometimes, sometimes a riff that could be like 15 years old. I don't have like another thing that goes along with the well. It just kind of sits there, but it's there. It's on a hard drive or it's an idea or it's one little section that I might like really like, but I don't have something to follow it up with. So it sits there. And as new things happen, sometimes they get mixed with old things. And sometimes old things get mixed with new things. Nothing really gets wasted. Um, they just kind of sit there. It's not like I take them and throw them in the trash can. So the manifestations were literally an ambient project that I was working on. I, you know, I did some, I worked with, uh, soul DJ soul slinger and some of the liquid sky folks in the nineties. And during that time period, I was into a lot of miles Davis bitches brew and stuff like that. And, um, I got into a lot more of the ambient and space stuff, more heady kind of stuff. And the manifestations literally became the home for a lot of that writing for that kind of spacey kind of stuff that happens in those manifestations. So I had like, yeah. I was able to kind of singe like a little bit of two different interests I had in music kind of together and found a home for both of them. And I felt that that was kind of important as well too, because as much as I like heavy stuff, I also like, like I said, I like a lot of jazz stuff too, especially all that free form fusion stuff from that time period. And there's something about that stuff that kind of helped me go to another place as well. Uh, when I would close my eyes and listen to it and visualize whatever you listen to. If I listen to Bitches Brew, that album will take me to another place every time I listen to it. I've listened to that album straight, stoned, out of my mind, in every state of mind. And it's sometimes taken me to different places. So um, I kind of wanted that going forward as well to be able to satisfy some of those other artistic you know expressions i might have with music so i think going forward yeah there'll be some older stuff that'll be getting mixed in with newer stuff and um that's kind of kind of how it happens it's funny sometimes i'll listen to the to some of the older riffs i'll sit with tony and he'll be like that's kind of a cool one and I'm like, that's so funny it's like it's like 15 years old i haven't ever hold on he'll start playing some keyboard part to it or some, you know, some interval or something. And I'm like, wait, what's that? And he'll let them know. And then the creative process starts to happen just from just being in the room. So, um, and then sometimes that process happens where I have to simplify now, right? I'll be, when I'm in that process with him and they'll be like, hey, that's not really working right here. You need to change this. I'm like, oh, I could change that. What are you gonna do? You're gonna do something there. He goes, yeah. Then they'll do something there. And then I'll send it to, like, I'll write a lot of the, uh, string lines or melody lines on my keyboard here, but I'm not really a piano player or a, you know, a school musician. 
Tony, I'll say, this is kind of what I have or I'm thinking. And Tony goes, yeah, that kind of works. And then he's obviously a much more evolved musician to say the least. He'll take, he'll take some idea that I have and he'll mess with it a little bit. And then even with Tony, we'll say, you know, we really should have a violin on this part or, or the cello. Let's get in touch with Margaret and see, let's just send her the track, see what she comes up with. And so that's kind of how it, it's starting to happen going forward. The first album was mostly me writing full on structures, putting all the pieces in later. Mm -hmm. This time um, we're doing it kind of the same way where I kind of put the skeletons together and then I fill it in, but I'm much more open to being like, I don't want to fill up too much space here. I want to leave the space. I don't want the riffs to be so right. dense that I, it's just like too much going on and it becomes too like, almost like a, too much of like a cacophony of, of like different things just kind of slammed together. At some point, it still has to be musical. It has to make some kind of sense. So, um, too kitchen sinky. Right? Yeah, so it could feel that way. And we yeah. have songs that, like, we have a couple of songs that we started that kind of like, they kind of start to feel like that. So we put them aside, we'll revisit them, we'll go on that hard drive to stay there. I right. go back to the favorites, so I'm muting things, soloing things, moving things around, and then I'll replay them. And that's kind of how the process is kind of happening. I like the modern recording process. I would never go back to tape ever again. I know all the people are traditionalists and they're all into the vintage thing. I'm record, I use everything. You look behind me, I got a lot of line six shit. I love the line six shit. I also have all my tube amps and all my cabinets. I'll use everything, but I won't, I don't get caught up in the, um, uh, oh, I gotta have, you know, the drums recorded to tape because I need the tape compression and the this and the that. I don't get caught up in that. I would never, ever, ever want to go back to the old way of recording. It would, it would stifle the freedom and the creativity that I actually have right now. I could sit in this room for six hours. Usually it's like midnight on. And I could sit in here for six hours. I look at the clock. I'm like, holy shit, six hours went by. I can't, couldn't do that the other way. I could never own that, that equipment. The reel-to-reel -reel machines. It would have to be, everything would be ready at that second, at that time to go right. and record. Right. When Into Darkness was done. And working. I mean, it would have to be functional too, which with the, tape machines. Well, right. See, yeah. something that people don't really understand about Into Darkness, which is really important. That album was completely done. Me and John listened to that record. And man, we listened to it. It, was like, it needs something. It needs, it needs something or another layer of something. We met Tony because uh, our friend Bob Barry worked with him at a record store. Tony was a manager of a record store called Titus Oaks on Long Island. Bob Barry was our friend. He also made the winter videos for us and he made the thorn videos for us. And he made videos for other artists in New York, Nausea and a bunch of other groups. He said, hey, my record store manager uh, plays organ and keyboards and stuff. And we mentioned to Bob, we, we, the record was done. We didn't mix it yet, but it was done. Mm -hmm. and he introduced us to Tony. We went to Tony's house and man, it was crazy. We went in his basement. He had two original mini moves that he bought in the late 60s. He had a, you know, two Hammond B3s with Leslie cabinets or a Wurlitzer or a string, a string ensemble, you know, our string ensemble and all these keys. It was like Keith Emerson around him. We went in there. We were like two 18, 19 year old kids, you know, like, I mean, literally, I was 18 when we were writing that stuff for Into Darkness. John was a year older than me. We went in there. He was just tuning up the moves, just like letting the oscillators warm up. I'm like, yo, that's the sickest sound. And he'd be like, dude, I'm just tuning the thing up. And I'm like, no, 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 that's, we want that sound. Like if you listen to like Power Might, you hear those mm -hmm. noises. That's just the guy tuning up the keyboard, you know? And then when he, when we played Oppression Freedom, Oppression Reprise, that song was killing us because it felt so dry without the keyboards. When you listen to that and you hear him playing those string sounds and that's what he's playing on top of it, that's what helps transcend you to the next level. When I talk about like Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, when you hear all those little keyboards, you know, that are happening, by, I think that's Joe Zalanol, and you hear the, the chord and the little chords on top of the things, that's what makes the music have this depth, depth perception and adds another element to the music. So 
Tony still came in and I'll never forget it. Uh, Greg Marshak, you know, rest in peace. He, um, he was an older cat too. So me and John were some young kids. I was 18, 19. And uh, Greg was uh, probably in his 40s. He was similar to the age of Tony. When he was in the other room with his keyboard playing, I'll never forget, Greg looked at me and John in the control and says, where did you guys find that guy? Because he was, he was like a real musician already at that point. We were just like some punk rock kids playing punk rock. Didn't know what the fuck we were doing, but we knew we wanted to hear something. And he looked, where did you guys find Tim? We just kind of like laughed and he goes, and he looked at us, he goes, you guys are artists. He's a musician. And we're like, yeah, well, we're very lucky. And we said, told him the story how we met him. And, you know, he did like literally like two takes. He went in there, pressure free, and was like, ah, I got some kind of idea. And we were like, oh, oh my God. Like, like he had brought it to the next level. And then slowly he played on about four of the songs at that point. And people don't really realize that, but we literally waited a while before we released that. The drummer quit in the middle of the recording. He finished his tracks, said it's too slow. You guys suck. No one's going to like this. Fuck you. And he left. He left us hanging right when the record came out. We never really toured on the record because of that. We couldn't really find the drummer. Um, Scott Lewis actually helped us out from Brutal Truth. Uh, he sat in on a couple of live shows and Roy Mayoga as well helped us out. But ultimately, that's what killed the, that's what took the life out of, out of winter. Record came out, it was too slow. People didn't dig it. Everyone was playing fast. We didn't have a drummer. Just kind of felt like, you know what, we love this, but the world's not ready for it, or maybe it'll never be ready for it. And we just kind of moved on. But I guess my point is people don't realize about that. It, that record sat dormant for literally maybe 10 years, 15 years during that process. I moved on and I, I you know, I did the Thorn thing and whatever, and the Liquid Sky folks and all those people too. So, um, yeah, so yeah, I don't know if I'm sure if I've given you enough information to <laughs> Fine, fine. But, uh, but the, but I mean, that dynamic is different though, right? From where you're, you're at the root, uh, you know, even if you're still at the root of the, of the composition musically, even by sort of knowing that someone else is going to add to it, it changes what you're doing. Totally. 100%. Because when when you have a three piece like winter you're trying to have fill up as much sonic space as you have on the palette to use the bass is distorted big and fat and disgusting and then the, the guitar comes in and it's like you know just a layer of shit on sludge on top of it and you're filling up this large space which is cool so now you now you have to think about well i want to have these other elements in there i only have so much space to work with sonically how am I going to share that space? So you have to think about how you want to do that. But with winter, I didn't have to do that because all we were doing is filling up this tremendous amount of space. But with Godin, I still want to have that tremendous amount of space that we had with the guitar and bass because that's important to me. I feel like that's part of like uh, my DNA of, the, of that music. But I also want to have the other elements. So you have all this stuff that's happening in this low, low mid area. And Tony is like my, he's like my supporting um, guitar, right? With his Hammonds and so on, right? He backs up. He's like, he's literally my second rhythm guitar. Mm -hmm. And plays move on the records. He's also my bass player as well as my bass player. So he was, so by God, it actually becomes fatter than winter because you can only do so much with the bass. And then the guitars, right? You could tune them down and do all that shit as much as you want. You still only have so much sonic space you need to use. So I, so Tony and I literally filling up even more space for what we have, but it's much more refined. It's very, it's very sectioned out so that when you listen, if you listen to the God and record, you spent a lot of time to make it so that every, all the elements could be there. Everything can be heard and can be clear as well as being, you know, thick and a little raunchy sounding kind of together. Um, I do think the process is different though. I like leaving the space open for the other things. It's like, oh, wow, cool. I didn't, didn't think of those colors. But now that I'm working with the people I'm working with, 
and have a great relationship with them, it's even easier moving on to the second record. Because we have like, we have like a starting point. Beyond Darkness is like, okay, we introduce these elements. This is part of our sound. Those, those sounds that Tony uses, I mean, the ARP and the Hammond, we use those on Into Darkness. All we did was, they're in our rehearsal room. All we did was like, okay, we're writing a new song for God. Well, we know that's our sound, let's use it. So we actually took it, it's, it's grown, we planted the seeds, the seeds are starting to grow. And now the next record, I think we have like more of like an established kind of sound moving forward. I do think that the um, next record will be, it'll be different, but it'll, it'll certainly have all of those elements. We, we're not gonna change any of those. We spent enormous amounts of time thinking about how, what we wanted the group to sound like, sonically, visually, lyrically, and um, yeah, and that's, that's kind of the process. I look forward to the new record, although I don't, I feel a little zapped from the first record. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, totally. Rightfully so. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a huge record. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested at the prospect of a single LP, like a, it, you know, because it is, it is this consuming, overwhelming mass of an album is beyond darkness. And it's, uh, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but it's brilliant because that's exactly what it's designed to be, right? And it is exactly what it's designed to be. But I am, I, but I'm interested to experience that kind of storytelling uh, on on a, a more condensed scale. It, it will be more condensed for sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take away exactly what we're going to do just yet. Cause so long. Oh, come on. Nobody watches this far into my interviews anyway. You can give everything <laughs> away. I mean, listen, it's gonna, we're probably not going to do eight manifestations for sure. It'll probably be <laughs> one more, maybe one really important section, mm -hmm. maybe even, but definitely have uh, our section in there. And then musically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be probably similar, the same direction. We, everyone wants to do the actual, everyone wants to do a cover of, uh, like, we will follow Triptychon in one way. We enjoy playing some of the winter songs. The members are from winter. Vic was the drummer for winter. Tony was in winter. I was in winter. Like I said, I don't dislike those songs. I have no, no, you know, issues with winter. So when we rehearse or whatever, sometimes we'll warm up and we'll do a song like Servants or we'll do a song like Garden or on the album in, uh, Beyond Darkness, we did the song Winter, which winter. was from the demo, which was an instrumental. And then Voss took Eternal Frost lyrics, made them in German and sang over the instrumental and made it into like its own song, almost to pay homage to it, right? We took Eternal Frost and we took the song Winter and we did kind of a mashup, the two together, and then she sang it in German. You know what I mean? So we just look, and it was fun to do that song. It was like, what, what song can we do that most people don't really know so much that we could kind of like, uh, you know, make our own and have fun with it. So maybe we'll do, we'll follow Trip to Con in, in that regard and maybe play, maybe we'll add another winter song for fun or something like that to it. I mean, we rehearse them anyway. It's not like, you know, it's fun anyway to play them. Right. You know, we're warming up. Yo, Vic, let's just warm up. Let's do like servants to just warm up. Or let's do, you know, God is probably my favorite song on the Into Darkness album. So, and that one Tony plays on too. So it's a good warm up for everyone. So we'll see, we'll see what happens in, in the future. But, uh, and if we play live, we might play one too. I'm hoping that, you know, the, the winter fans that come along for the garden experience, um, they understand that it is kind of a continuation and we still, you know, love those old songs the same way Triptychon loves the old Celtic Frost songs. I mean, they still play everything too. So why not? Those are your fans. And, if they're gonna, you know, pay attention to you, buy your records and do everything, and they like those, why not do them? They're not gonna see Winter again. I don't think Winter will play live again. I think that's kind of probably in the past, uh, in the rear view mirror, and I think Godwin's in the windshield, you know, looking out, looking forward. Uh, that's, for me at least, I really don't have any interest in playing with Winter a uh, lot. It's, it's like um, playing like a, let's say like a wedding band or a cover band at this point, we just would be playing it. We played it, we did it and it was nice and feel very fortunate that we played Road Bar and a couple of great festivals and so on. But my energy and creativity is 
we'll go to the new project. We'll go to God and just, just, I mean, Triptychon's not going to go and play Celtic Frost set. No, they're going to play Triptychon and maybe do a couple of Celtic Frost songs. It's they're just, playing Hellhammer sets, aren't they? Oh, are they really? Yeah, I think they did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty but sure. Uh, pretty sure they were doing. They were doing like a tour of Hellhammer songs. Pretty oh, sure. I put- it's the trip to con uh it's the trip to con uh lineup though i would think right i think it is yeah i mean it's yeah. not gonna be martin no right obviously martin Ann's not there yeah <laughs> so, but anyway anyway yeah we'll see. We'll the example see. the example stands what oh. would it take to make godden happen live like just logistically who needs um, to be there how many how many pieces are in that band well the the way Godin will not be like a touring. No, right? No. Not at all. It will be, if we do do it, it'll probably be, we've been over a couple of key festivals that we feel we would be interested in doing. And it would be um, everyone. I give everyone the option to play it on the record. You want to be part of it? You guys all contributed something. You're all intrinsically part of our like little village we have of people. It is a village, yes. It's a village. I mean, I mean, listen, in the heavy metal world, it's usually like a three piece, four piece, five piece, right? This has so many people. It's more like a jazz record. I mean, you look at like a jazz record. Sometimes you look at the lineup and you're like, holy cow, it's like 12 people on this record. Yeah. But we're putting something into it. I feel like everyone, if you want, say we played Roadburn, you guys want to come, whoever's part of it, you're welcome to come. Whatever songs you play and we play them, you can walk out, you can plug your guitar into an amp, you know, Margaret, you can bring your violin, your cello, come along for the ride. Whatever drummers you guys want to come, you can figure it out. Um, I can't necessarily say I can finance all of you to get there, but you're all welcome to do it. Right. And you're all welcome to be part of it in whatever form that may be. So I do think we'll play a couple of festivals once we come out of uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. world. We'll see, whatever. But, um, but yeah, we would definitely do it. Not tons of gigging, but... A couple of key shows, and, and we'll say right now it seems to be interesting. People are offering us a few things, but um, yeah, everything's kind of on hold. We'll see. Right, of course. Select yes. dates. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna let you go there. I'm gonna stop the recording. Stefan, thank you so much for this. Uh, before I do stop the recording, so hang on okay. just a second. Don't don't sign off yet. But thank you again, and and congratulations on beyond okay. darkness happening hey thank you everyone who bought it we're grateful um i don't know what i'll say thank you uh, all you people that bought the record enjoy the record comment on it share it and all that kind of stuff we are grateful and um just hope to see you on the next record awesome hang on just a second